Yeah, so hello everybody, I hope you can you can hear me well. Uh, my name's Mark, I'm one of the, the IMT twos currently working at Chap Allerton. I was asked by, by Long to, to give a talk today about a subject that's close to my heart, which is a point of care ultrasound. And to in a similar way to the talk that I gave to the IMT twos who run intensive care with me in our own little teaching, to summarise to talk a little bit about point of care ultrasound. And its applications and its uses it's becoming more common and it's something i think that we should all be aware of even if we're not specifically wanting to practice it um my contact information is on there if you want to get hold of me in regards to any of these uh, these issues i suppose to to kind of get started i'll, I'll give a little bit of an introduction mm. to what pocus is for those of you who are pocus naive a little bit about the applications and then the main focus of today's talk is on the the cases and the uses that we can use it for as medics so how we use it as an in the inpatient setting and looking at a little bit about the image applications and the technical demands but focusing mainly on how we can use it as as medical doctors and then towards the end we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that focus raises and how to deal with them if it's something that you want to get involved in but also if you're a clinician who's coming across people that are practicing POCUS, how you see it and how you can deal with some of the issues that it may raise. The, the main caution I want to give is that today is not about teaching how to perform POCUS. It takes a long time to, to develop the knowledge base behind practicing any of these particular techniques. And if it's something you want to develop, it's certainly something that anyone can develop an interest in. But it takes time in each modality to understand some of the the physics of it, understand the anatomy that you're going to be scanning, and that takes time. That takes much longer than an hour would ever be suitable for. So this is not about trying to teach you how to do it. This is about understanding how it's useful. If you want to get get into it, into focus, then ultimately hands-on mentorship is the way to go. And finding people who, who share the passion and getting involved in the community that's associated with it. Very briefly, for people who aren't aware of what POCUS is, point of care ultrasound is essentially just the use, uh, the non specialist use of ultrasound at the bedside to make clinical decisions relative to the situation that you're in. For the most part, that's going to be acute care decisions and helping you answer a specific query that is otherwise difficult to answer. There is also an application with POCUS as it refers to skill performance. But for the sake of this, we'll focus more on the imaging examination modality to help make clinical decisions. And the aim is essentially just to answer that, that clinical question to improve patient care, to be able to give a quick resolution and a quick answer to a situation to help you make a clinical decision for a patient who's unwell or a patient that needs treatment at the bedside in that moment. So why is... Why is POCUS a thing and what purpose is it serving? The main benefit to point of care ultrasound is to try to reduce the amount of time that one is spending um, trying to work out what the diagnosis is by reducing our time from presentation to definitive diagnosis. And some of that is about identifying more subtle pathology that other imaging and examination with a stethoscope simply won't pick up. There's also benefits trying to increase our examination objectivity so we can use that in terms of trending findings to try and titrate therapies a little bit better, which is one of the main applications in that benefit having it at the bedside is that ability to use it in different points of time. From a clinical skills perspective, the other main use that it has is, is improving your first pass rates with clinical skills and by being able to visualize what's going on and see the structure that you're aiming for or understand the tissue that you're trying to take a sample from we're much better able to perform that skill well and then if you're like me i'm a very visual person but having the ability to see what's going on in an image and interpret that can be of great use and certainly i find but the ability to see something helps me put it into context of what I'm seeing with a patient. That's one of my main uh, enjoyments of, of doing point-of-care ultrasound. 
ultrasound is is relatively common in intensive care and in and in uh, the emergency departments and anaesthetics, but it hasn't really made its way over to the medical floor yet. And there's multiple reasons behind that. A part of that is probably because we don't have the same acuity as some of our our colleagues who work in more intensive environments. Um, our workload requirements can be different too in terms of what we're trying to achieve with our workload. And you know, another key factor is how we move over time as the senior doctors moving towards an outpatient environment rather than staying as an inpatient focused clinician. That combined with the mainly junior led inpatient workforce means that the time it takes to acquire the skill by then you've often moved on into something else and you're doing this in an outpatient setting where you may well just be focusing on the organ of choice. There's also a big factor of the cost to this and the inability to get the ultrasound scanners to the environments where we work. And as of anything, because it's new, that's a big block to it. But the future is coming and the prices of ultrasound has, has dropped dramatically in the last five years and will likely continue to do so until an ultrasound probe is a couple of hundred pounds and most of the software that comes with it is reasonably cheap. At that point then, when there will be easy access, the question is how will it revolutionise care and ultimately based on the ability to be more objective, it's likely that this is going to become the preferred examination modality, certainly in certain specialties, where examining their organ is more difficult. I wanted to spend a brief period of time talking about intravenous cannulation, which is something that uh, was one of these areas that first got me interested into ultrasound. And it's something that, as particularly as medical SHOs on a ward dealing with patients that are difficult to cannulate, that may require good amounts of fluid or certain therapies that are going to be, needs to be run through larger veins. The ability to perform ultrasound cannulation is really quite important. In our patient cohort, thinking about the more obese patients who can be difficult to palpate a vein for, and the patients with comorbidities who may be undergoing regular chemotherapy or have vascular issues, they can be really difficult to, to easily ascertain access from. And in the days gone by, it was a case of speaking to the registrar and anaesthetics, and that's going to come along, but they're increasingly busy, as are we. And the ability to be able to provide ultrasound cannulation is really useful. The difficulty is it's an easy skill in practice, but actually doing it on a patient is much more difficult and requires a lot of practice. If you're the type of person that wants to develop an interest in it, it's a great start into this world of ultrasound. And it gives you a, an understanding of how useful this can be to be able to visualise what's going on in real time to help you do skills much better. With ultrasound um, intravenous cannulation, there's lots of different modalities and there's lots of resources these days, as well as a massive body of evidence that suggests that you can do this relatively quickly, relatively easily, and have significantly improved first pass rates, reducing the amount of times the patient needs to receive a needle into the arm. So it's this kind of skill that we should be developing. And it's not this is not the aim of a talk today to talk too much about it, but it's to give this idea of these are the types of areas where ultrasound is really starting to make a step into the into the foray. The technique in itself then becomes easily reproducible and in patients who've got difficult access you need bloods from or if you're doing regular arterial gases on patients who've got very very poor arterial flow this can be a really significant improvement in every single aspect of the patient's care and it can be and there's a, a very good paper written about this that if you're able to do these types of things you can reduce your delays in therapy you can have these delays in antibiotic doses being given cut down significantly if the workforce is much better at providing this skill. We could all be doing it, but it's one of these areas that's only very slowly leaping its way in, but in the course of the next few years, particularly in the next sort of decade, this could well be the way that a majority of people on the ward receive their cannulas because the evidence base is good that this really works for patients. So I said I'd run through relatively quickly. I don't want to talk too much about the practicalities of all these things and why it's good, because I'm hoping to show you that with the cases. The cases here do not assume any degree of knowledge. I will talk all the cases through and be able to highlight them, hopefully, with the, with the help of the presentation. The focus in all these cases is on, on level one care, so it's inpatient care on the medical floor, patients that we may well come across 
and the differences that we can make. With any kind of point-of-care alternative, it assumes that you can't get hold of the definitive form of imaging in any reasonable time frame. So it's a it's a night shift and there's a patient you really want to know an answer on, or it's a weekend and getting hold of a scan may take some time. These are all applications where I've seen Focus used or used it myself personally. But I'm not an expert, and all these cases have some degree of nuance and have some degree of variance, but that's kind of the point is it's about the discussion that we can have to very briefly say if you don't know anything about ultrasound which is fine and i don't assume any knowledge from anybody the fluid is dark and the denser structures will be brighter and we'll talk through all of that as we we go through but there's no knowledge in all the different types of physics expected within this uh, within this talk at all so the first case um is a relatively common case that one might see on the medical floor. It's a um, elderly female admitted to the, to the elderly team. She's been short of breath for one week with an increasing, increasing cough and fatigue and generally not quite right. In terms of her medical history, she's had a, a local excision of a breast cancer three years ago, but otherwise is essentially medically fit and well. But as she arrives with you on the, on the care floor, she's hypotensive despite having received some fluids and the bloods don't suggest that she's got a severe sepsis or that she's severely dehydrated, she just remains hypotensive. And the emergency department have treated her as a low, lower respiratory tract infection and have admitted her across having received some antibiotics. She's remained hypotensive despite all the fluid and you've, you've done your typical things, you've looked at your medications, there's no obvious medications that are causing this. She doesn't look quite right, there's something not fitting this picture of just a woman who's hypotensive, there's a tachycardia that's come with it. But the haemoglobin's okay, the kidney function looks all right, and there's something that you can't quite explain. When you go and examine a patient, all you notice is a JDP that's slightly enlarged, but otherwise you can't see anything that gives you any particular concern. So looking for your differentials, you think, well, hey, this could just be a pericardial effusion because you're a very astute medic. Or is there some other cause within the heart itself that's causing this patient to develop hypotension? So you pop your ultrasound probe on the chest and this is what you see. I'll give you a second just to, to digest uh, the image and have a look at it. And what I hope you can appreciate um, is within this space here, uh, which is a space around the outside of a heart, we can see some fluid, some dark fluid. We can appreciate these are the, the ventricles here, this is the heart, and this space here is some pericardial fluid, which is obviously not, not normal. So in terms of the questions that we've, we've asked, is, is there a pericardial effusion? Well, yes, there's, there appears to be a pericardial effusion. And is there significant cardiac dysfunction? Well, there is, uh, we can see the heart beating on the subcostal view, it's part of the reason why we like this view. And we can appreciate the heart is beating, it appears reasonably normal, and certainly within the context of what we're trying to answer, there appears to be organised cardiac activity. The only other thing to note here is on this view is appreciate some slight dysfunction of the right ventricle. So this is a patient who, although this is a significant pericardial effusion, it's not tamponading yet, which is appreciated by a collapse of that right ventricle, but perhaps we're starting to get there and that's why we're seeing the hypertension form part of the patient's presentation. So the subcostal view, as I've just mentioned, is a a reasonably simple view taken from the, the routine echo package, so to speak, of the four views that you, you try to ascertain with an echo. And it, as a view itself, it's reasonably simple because all it expects from the person performing the echo is an ability to point at the heart from underneath the diaphragm. And what we then appreciate is a is the pericardium on the outside, followed by a four chamber view of the heart as we go through. On these different views you can appreciate here, we can see firstly on the image that we have looked at previously, this collection of pericardial fluid on the outside. On the image below here, we can appreciate even more fluid around the outside of a heart, which is particularly concerning. That would be a patient who has developed tamponade, that right ventricle compressing down throughout the whole cardiac cycle. On the other images that we have here, we can appreciate a heart, this is the liver, which is the the board we pass through to get to the heart in this view. And what we can appreciate 
is atrial beating and ventricle is not beating. So this is someone, that's someone with a complete heart block, which you'd hope to pick up on ECG, but it can certainly provide some context as to why you may not be seeing a good cardiac output as perhaps you would want. This view is the, the view that we use for the FEEL protocol, which is the focused and focused echocardiographical assessments in ALS. And it helps you rule out cardiac tamponade. The one thing that everyone mentions is there are four H's and four T's, but no one can ever actively exclude. And this is how you do it. It's a very simple view that provides a good amount of knowledge about what's going on with the patient and otherwise can be very difficult to spot without having the image and the information as it is presented here in front of you. So my next case to present is that of an elderly male present on the, the medical ward, admitted after having a period of sort of increased lethargy, reduced urine output, um, not eating and drinking. This is the GP, which is not being quite right, had some routine bloods which highlighted a new API2. Uh, with some hematuria on a, on a urine stick, uh, but also been having fevers every now and then for the last few days. It's been receiving some IV fluids whilst it's been admitted under the medics. Urine output's generally still not doing very much, talking a few mils an hour, if that. Um, but the bladder scan doesn't suggest there's any retained volume. The catheter seems to be working all right and flushing okay. You're a doctor on call, you're asked to prescribe some more fluids overnight. Uh, the patient's already had a good two, three litres of fluid, but uh, the plan is to keep going with aggressive IV rehydration for this guy. No cardiac history at all. But despite the, the IV fluids now, three, four litres in, there's still no urine output, and the patient looks uvolemic, and if anything, it's becoming more hypertensive, and your concern is that you're giving too much fluid, you may well send him into pulmonary edema, despite him not having a cardiac history. So the question is then is, is why is my fluid not working? Why am I not seeing any urine output? And is there something post renal going on that we've not yet identified? Or is there some bladder outlet obstruction that the bladder scan simply isn't picking up? So so point of care ultrasound, and I'll give you a second to digest the image on the, the top there, which is the main image of focus. And just to give you some reference, this is a kidney, uh, in case you weren't aware of what it was. <clears throat> and in answer to our questions here, the question is about is there is there any uh, hydronephrosis? And I hope you can appreciate there is some hydronephrosis in this kidney. And when we rock it through, we can appreciate here some fluid where we wouldn't expect fluid to be, there's some hydroureter and some fluid within the renal pyramids. So this is, this is a case of hydronephrosis, or this is fluid that's backed up. And to add to this, on the, the bottom of the image here, we've got a, a bladder with, with a small degree of retained volume, but a catheter that looks like it's in the right place. So in terms of answering the questions that we've set ourselves there, is there post-renal obstruction? Well, there appears to be some hydronephrosis of that kidney. Is there a bladder obstruction uh, or something happening with the outlet? Well, the catheter's in side tube and it's not draining properly. So I need to fit this into my pictures as the catheter need changing, but also that degree of hydronephrosis is concerning. I need to have a further look into that and compare it to the other side. So the basic KUB scan, the basic kidney scan with a look at the kidney windows is a reasonably easy scan to obtain, albeit there'll be ribs in the way, uh, potentially other organs interfering, and um, the presence of the respiration moving the the kidney up and down. It's normally found within the mid axillary line, and as long as you're able to appreciate the anatomy around it, it should be reasonably easy to spot. The urine is dark, any fluid is dark on ultrasound as it's so uh, echogenic. And what I hope you'll be able to appreciate here is the differences in terms of how it looks within the kidney structure, which we'd expect in order to be reasonably uniformly dense. What you can see here on this top image is some very, very small, um, almost dependent looking bits of hydronephrosis here which is just a tiny bit of fluid, you would almost barely call that hydronephrosis as it is. With a normal looking sort of renal pelvis, there's no massive hydronephrosis, but a little bit of dependent fluid. Moving over to the image on the right here, the bare claw appearance of the kidney with a significant hydroureter and pockets of fluid in the renal pyramids here, which is relatively obvious. It would be an easy spot if you were looking at ultrasound to say that's a kidney that's developed hydronephrosis. On the bottom image here, we have the appearances of a normal uniform bladder 
Um, look, when you're looking for your outflow obstructions, you could be looking for the catheter tail um, stuck with a prostate. You should be able to see the patient's catheterized, a catheter balloon within there, um, looking relatively obvious. And obviously, we can't see that um, on this image. So if you had inserted a catheter and you couldn't see it, then that catheter ain't going to be doing very much. The image on the right here is a, a ureteral jet, uh, which is an example of the urine being expulsed out through the ureter from the kidney, which gives you an idea that the ureter itself is, is functioning normally. And when you combine all this together with your, your imaging of the kidney um, in, a, in a variety of different planes to check for any retained fluid that looks like hydronephrosis within the kidney, that's including a view of the bladder with any jets and a visualization of the catheter, you can give a very good idea of the post renal. Uh, structure. And if there's any issues identified, you can add that into your clinical picture with regards to managing and protecting the patient's renal system. Moving on to, to case three, my final full case. This is the case of a, a middle-aged man present on the ward who's got a history of dilated cardiomyopathy. He's presented having been unwell at home with a cough, short of breath, and has been admitted to the medical floor felt to have chest sepsis as the most likely cause, but he's dehydrated, he's got some, uh, he's got some renal um, marker elevation consistent with dehydration. He's given a bit of fluid down in ED, who are being very cautious because of his history of heart failure. They've stopped his diuretics and he's had 500 mil bolus downstairs and he's having a maintenance bag of fluids as he is now. The urine output's not great. As you're asked to see him, the patient's still hypotensive, despite not being tachycardic. A uh, short of breath, and it seems to be worsening. Um, you're concerned that's part of potentially congestion, some of his fluid status. But ultimately, he's hypotensive. You're worried that he's maxing out on his cardiac function. Potentially, he may need vasopressor inotropic support in, in ICU or HDU. But you want to know where you are with his fluids. Does he need more fluid? Is there any state fluid? Is this shorts of breath just related to the chest infection? It's hard to tell. So you do small sound. So uh, this is the ultrasound image you obtain from this gentleman. Uh, you'll have to ignore the, the presence of a heart that looks like it's beating slightly harder than uh, 35% would be uh, reflecting. But the main structure I want to just try and identify is this here and to, to have a thought about it. Now, what I hope you can appreciate from this imaging is that this vein, which is the inferior vena cava, uh, draining directly into the right atrium, is collapsing down a little bit on respiration. And this is something we'll talk about more on the next slide. But this would suggest that the patient is not, um, is not congested from a fluid perspective and may well benefit from further fluids if not already, um, uh, if not already decided. So the IVC um, can, can at times be controversial, but it is a very simple window adapted from the subcostal view, uh, which we talked about briefly earlier. And this view is an ascertainment of the, a rough ascertainment of the central venous pressure using the IVC as it's the easiest thing for us to look at. We can assume that the lack of valves between the inferior vena cava and the right atrium means that the central venous pressure taken from the right atrium reasonably correlates to the function seen in the IVC. Um, albeit, albeit there's lots of variables in this, it gives us a rough idea. As you can see on the image on the top here, that's how you take it, similar to how you take a subcostal view from roughly this reason. This is just lined up with the IVC. And we have to be careful not to grab some aorta in that imaging. But if we use this the values that we get from this, either using the automatic modes that come on the ultrasounds these days or using a motion mode, we should be able to size the IVC correctly from three centimetres from the hill to the right atrium. That, combined with collapsibility, roughly interprets towards our central venous pressure. And that's how we can work out if we feel the patient is congested or may benefit from further fluids. As the CVP increases and ultimately the IVC increases with it, with less collapsibility, the scope for fluid to be a benefit to the patient decreases. Particularly when we trend this over time, we can accurately work out when we think a patient may well stop benefiting from IV fluids. We can combine this 
into the VEXUS assessment, which stands for Venus XS Ultrasound. And when we combine the IVC reading as shown here in the basic interpretation, if the IVC is less than two centimetres used in, in this example, we can then say quite comfortably there is no congestion, albeit there is some nuance to that as well. If the IVC is over two centimetres, we can start to look at the Doppler flows, which is a reflection on the movement of the blood within the venous system. And if the hepatic vein, which is the first structure, particularly the middle hepatic vein, which comes right off the IVC, you can appreciate in this bottom image here, there's a backflow, and every time the right atrium is contracting, there is a significant return of blood back into the hepatic vein that would suggest there is already signs of congestion occurring within the right side of the heart, which would be a suggestion that maybe fluids wouldn't work in this patient because all you'll be doing is further saturating the system. The hepatic vein doppler can be your first indication you have got a patient who's developing a form of hepatic congestion, which you may well pick up in the days to come with changes in liver tests or through hepatomegaly, but this is a much more sensitive and much earlier sign of that hepatic congestion. When we work through the VEXUS protocol, which is, is still relatively new, it's only a year or two old, but it's developing more and more evidence behind it, what we start to appreciate is that we can, reason, to a reasonably accurate level, say if a patient's going to become congested or is starting to develop signs of congestion. And as you work back from your hepatic vein to your portal vein to your renal vein, as we move down the venous system, um, almost down the body in order, we can start to appreciate where this congestion may be coming from. Particularly in the renal vein doppler, if we're seeing a every single time as a heartbeat, a significant movement of blood back towards the renal vein, that would be quite concerning, would be a suggestion that this patient's starting to become severely congested at that point. The main benefit of this is it increases your ability to be objective in your ultrasound, in your ability to suggest that there's congestion. And that's the main thing is it can be very hard for clinicians outside of expert renal and cardiac consultants to say if congestion is occurring. And we can have a look at JVP and, and talk about sizes and the nature of how JVP is moving, but we can be much more focused here in our assessment and say if we think congestion is occurring or not, and to what extent within what structures, and record Dopplers and compare Dopplers over time if needs be. So those are my three quick cases, those are my, my three long cases. What I'm going to do now is talk through a few quicker cases where ultrasound is really useful. But there won't be a big vignette around it, it won't be lots of detail, it's just purely about the images and a very, very brief clinical situation the views here are different, and I won't spend as much time explaining, but this is to explain how we could use ultrasound in the future and how ultrasound is already being used in certain settings. The, the case of pneumothorax, the thing that scares every med reg when they're alone in the district general overnight, um, and it's always a curious case when a when a pneumothorax shows up. Uh, if, if you take a moment to have a look at this chest x-ray, if you're not on a a decent stream, it may well be difficult to appreciate. What I hope you'll be able to see is there's a long edge here. And certainly, when you briefly look at this image, that's all you may see. And if a junior doctor came up to you and said, oh, I'd like you to put a chest drain in that, the patient's short of breath. If you had a very quick look at that image, you may well think, yes, that is a pneumothorax. So I'm not seeing any protrusions to the long edge here. I need to put a chest drain in that. The, the POCUS trained clinician may well have a different opinion and decide to do an ultrasound just to confirm it. And what we can see here is the movement, partly due to the artifacts of the uh, pleura moving over one another, is the movement of the sort of antline roll, rock and roll of the, the pleura. And this suggests very strongly to a very high specificity that there is no pneumothorax here, that the lung lining is pressed up against the pleura and that there is no pneumothorax, which makes you wonder what we saw on the first image. It's a brave call, but if you send this patient for a, a CT scan and convince the radiologist that it's something that needs doing, what you can appreciate now is a massive buller here, which may well have accounted for the findings on the chest x-ray. And if we put a chest ray into that, we wouldn't be doing the patient any favours at all. But you can see how someone on the first chest x-ray could have been convinced that it was time to put a chest drain in this patient, particularly if they were unwell or developing worsening symptoms. 
I don't want to talk too much about echoes because echoes are a, a whole world to their own and take a long time to get good at. This is a, a brief image here of a patient who's undergoing a an echo assessment, uh, which was done at the bedside. And what this shows rather nicely is this growth here, flapping up and down in the aortic valve. And you see it just occasionally rocking and rolling into view in a variety of these different views, um, which is no longer a parasternal long axis, but is flipping through. And this mass here is really quite significant and very easy to see even on relatively basic imaging. And the finding of that on the acute floor of a patient who's a little bit unwell would really make you worry and make you wonder that person should be under a cardiologist or a cardiac surgeon, not on an acute medical, acute medical floor. And it's a rather obvious mass. Most effective endocarditis will not be like that. But when it is, it's an easy spot. And here on our subcostal view, you can even appreciate it there when they get the aortic valve into view. And another successful subcostal view. This is a, an interesting image, um, again reflecting another echo view, which is relatively easy to ascertain at the bedside. And in this particular case here, again taken from the left sternal edge of the plaques view, as it's known by echo, we can see some really significant hypertrophy here on either side of the ventricle, both anteriorly and posteriorly. A mitral valve appears to be working reasonably well and has a good excursion, um, but not an overriding excursion into the left ventricle outflow tract. But the aortic valve here appears calcified and is not opening well at all. And particularly in the elderly patients who you may well hear, hear a murmur from, you may well discount some of this and say, well, this is just something that needs reviewing as an outpatient. But the presence of hypertrophy, which may well be missed on the ECG, um, this is quite significant hypertrophy, which you hope would show. But that valve is, is getting to a critical point in this patient could become very unwell very quickly in a sudden rapid episode of pulmonary edema could well be lethal. Having this patient referred to the TAVI team rather than this being done as an outpatient would be really useful for that patient to make a big difference to their, their ability to survive this disease. Again, an, another echo, um, I think this is the last one that I've, I've put on here. Uh, this is taken from an apical four chamber view, uh, which is essentially right ventricle here, right atrium, left ventricle, left atrium. And the right ventricle is normally a small sliver attached to the left ventricle. And what I hope you can appreciate is that this right ventricle looks enlarged. If anything, there's a bowing of the right ventricle into the left ventricle space. And this is consistent with, with a large PE. We can measure something called the TAPSI value, which is the tricuspid annular um, excursion. And that's measured from here as it moves up into the right ventricle, as the right ventricle contracts longitudinally. And what you can appreciate is that this isn't moving, this is a heart that is trying to beat against something, and the afterload in the right ventricle is very large and is not decreasing when it beats. Now, if you saw this in the context of pulmonary embolism, this would really make you worry that this person was, was peri-arrest and may well need thrombolysis. DVT is um, one of these areas where also has a lot of benefit and the ability to assess someone with, as a query DVT accurately in the community can be really difficult. But the ability to perform a scan can really save a lot of problems. Here in this particular image, we can appreciate a large mass here in, in a vein that otherwise would be compressible. We would be able to compress this the whole way up the vein as we track back our anatomy we'd get to a point where this would all of a sudden stop being compressible. And the only thing that's going to cause that is a, is a thrombosis in the vein, particularly when you're trying to make decisions about putting a patient on treatment dose anticoagulation, particularly patients who are more high risk with histories of GI bleeds or history of platelet disorders or bleeding disorders. This is the type of thing, if you could say definitively if it's there or not, can make a big difference. The approach should always be ruling in rather than ruling out, but if you wouldn't want to put them on and then you find this, it may well make a big decision to your decision to treat someone. So this is a, a really nice view of a, a really easy to spot pathology in ultrasound. Um, you don't even have to put a probe in the right place, all you have to do is put the probe on the abdomen. And what I hope you can appreciate here is the, the presence of fluid 
this darker fluid here, someone's trying to highlight over the top of me, but this fluid present here in this space, which is ascites, and a significant amount of fluid, particularly if you're about to perform a peri uh, peritoneal drain, if you're going to take some fluid from that space, it's really useful to be able to see what is underneath that area. To further that case, even small societies can be clinically important. And what I hope you can appreciate here is a small trace of fluid. This is within Morrison's pouch, which is a small, uh, more theoretical space that exists between the kidney and the, the uh, liver. And in this space here, there's small traces of fluid, which we may well not necessarily get too worried about, but it can be the sign of a start, patient start to develop ascites, may well lead to how we potentially changing management and factoring in outpatient follow-up and particularly in patients who are putting on weight it can be a good excuse as to as to why that may be occurring and that's all occurring within this space here a very small trace of fluid but still important in the clinical context uh, this is a still image um, which is is important because it could potentially solve many issues um, for us as non-specialists in eyes and what this is here is this is an image taken over and I have a linear probe, a load of gel attached to the eye. And the use of the gel and the ultrasound to penetrate through the orbit to check on the optic nerve at the back. And optic nerves, the assessment of pathodema can be really subjective. But what we can appreciate here is some clear protrusion of the optic nerve into the orbit. And this would be consistent with papilledema. We could also measure the optic sheath um, to, to also further back up the idea of there being papilledema. But this presence and this bulging of the optic nerve is really quite sensitive. And we can measure this too and put a number to it rather than just trying to grade roughly on a subjective assessment. I could tell you that that is four to five millimeters. And we can see how things change for treatment and see, particularly in cases of intracranial hypertension, see a movement or improvement over time. To add to the assessment of the back of the eye, and this is perhaps going too much up into the world of ophthalmology, but occasionally as the acute registrar call, you may well be asked to someone who's always sort of lost vision. And this here is quite important, retinal detachment here. The retina is quite clearly separated from the back of the orbit. And it's a rather easy thing to spot, a clear separation there at the back of the retina. And you may well be able to see that on fundoscopy, but if you're like myself and you don't back yourself with fundoscopy, it's a really easy assessment that gives you a very visual idea of what's going on with the patient. So I hope those cases have been interesting and I've got 10 minutes left to, to talk a little bit about the problems of ultrasound. And I hope that I've been able to sell you on the idea that there's lots of really interesting things we can pick up, but I've not talked about some of the problems it brings up. So it's important to, to add that context in. As you develop your, your way through ultrasound, you go through a variety of different stages. Um, and, and to summarize the sort of three main stages that you go through is, is essentially going from not being good enough to get your images to being good enough to get an image but not knowing what it is and then being good enough to know that there's something wrong and that you should do something about it. To start up on the far left here of this, of this PowerPoint, it's, being unable to ascertain image is incredibly common when you start, and the aim of point of care ultrasound is to add something to your assessment, and the inability to do something should never take away from your clinical narrative. So the inability to ascertain the image is not a fundamental problem. Nothing lost, nothing, nothing gained from the patient's perspective. As long as the patient understands why you're doing that assessment, no one comes to harm at all. It becomes more difficult when you're trying to determine what pathology, but you, you can't work out what it is. When you get to a point where you've done enough scans where you can identify a majority of the things you need to identify, but your pathology looks different. And this is quite, a, it's an uncommon situation, but it's an awkward situation to find yourself in. And ultimately, if you come across something and you were looking for a reason or something that concerns you, it should definitely have some form of formal investigation. The difficulty is how do you sell that to somebody? When I've, you've done a an IDC and you can see something weird within the liver, it can be really hard to sell to somebody. But at the end of the day, if we have a clinical suspicion, we should act on it. You should always, in that immediate instance, just follow your narrative. Points of care ultrasounds about providing things in the moment. 
And as far as you're concerned, if you've not really, if it doesn't fit your narrative and you're not sure what it is, it doesn't change what you do now. But as long as you document that you found something and that you think potentially there should be further follow up for it because you couldn't work out what it is, then there's no no loss. And at the end of the day, everything we're doing with ultrasound, it should be easily reproducible with further ultrasound. Identifying significant pathology is, is a, a really difficult area and it's something that I've come across a few times now. And it's difficult because you're doing a scan because you want it to change your narrative, you want to find something. Ultimately, when you do find something, it can be a really difficult situation to find yourself in. And often that means speaking to senior individuals, ordering more formal investigations in a timely manner. And if you need to, changing your clinical management. That doesn't necessarily mean telling the patient that you found something really concerning or attached to their kidney that when you were looking for hypnosis, you've seen something else. But it's knowing that there's something on your assessment that doesn't make sense, something doesn't fit and that doesn't look normal and that requires further investigation and putting that down on your list and making sure the patient receives the correct follow-up. The most nuanced area and perhaps the thing that people worry about the most is about missing things. But ultimately, the one thing that I hope I've been able to reassure people about in the, in the time I've been doing it is that POCUS is not about doing general assessments and just seeing what you find. When you're learning, it can be a little bit about that. But the key thing is about going in with a question and answering the question you have relative to the situation you're in. And if you are unable to answer that question, then you end up back where you were at the start. But if there's sinister pathology there, you should never be the person making the override decision to if that requires further management or not. That's not the job of a person providing focus. It's not to definitively say if there's a liver mass or a kidney mass. That's not what focus is about. And to that end, one of our most difficult things you can be doing is trying to sell someone when you've done some point of care ultrasound, but you just don't know where to go next with it. And trying to convince a radiologist that you've seen something on a scan and you want it looking at can be really, really difficult. Same thing with echoes. If you see an echo and you can see an abnormality on a valve, it's really difficult to sell that. But at the end of the day, is, is that our duty? If we do something and we find it, we're duty bound to go and look and make sure it's not anything to worry about. And that all feeds into the idea that point of care ultrasound creates issues and you will come across things by doing ultrasound that you weren't expecting. And on the images here on the right, um, I haven't talked too much about finding cancers because it's not the aim of POCUS. But you can appreciate here an abnormality in a bladder, sort of pathologous growth, growth, which may well be a transitional cell cancer. If you can see masses within a liver, which we were not expecting when we were checking an IBC, or we can see a growth on a kidney when we were just looking to rule out hydronephrosis in the patient who's got some hematuria and something's not right about their kidney function. At the end of the day, if you were doing these assessments purely to look at that, then that's not the aim, and that's not what you should be trying to achieve. But as with trauma CTs, incidental findings do occur. And there was an interesting study that came out which showed that 10% of fast scans pick up cysts and pick up pathology. And that's part of the reality of doing ultrasound, is you will find anatomical variants, you will find normality, but you'll also find occasionally pathology. And we know now, the use of POCUS, not that it's an area that people should really get it too much into, but if we find masses on point of care ultrasound, we can massively reduce the time to diagnose and the time to first presentation. It may take many months. If we can spot an indolent mass and refer it properly, we can make a difference. The question is, is that the aim of POCUS? And certainly for someone who's relatively junior, that shouldn't be what we're trying to achieve. But if it happens, we should know what to do with it. And ultimately, presenting, presenting this imaging to try and convince people to do further scans can be really difficult, particularly because we, can't, we don't save, we don't put things onto packs, because that's very much the way we document what we see in the medical notes and we move on. That's the way most of it's done. So making sure the correct follow-up occurs can be really difficult. The other issue that it creates is that subjectivity in ultrasound examination is a problem as well. Although we like to think of ultrasound being objective, there is variance between people in terms of how they get images. And that just compounds the idea that we're not perfect and that no, no examination modality will ever 100% pick things up and there will always be a degree of variance between people. So how do, with all this in mind, how do you practice 
point of care? How do you get into point of care? How do you get it done? I always think that the few main things is is making sure the patient knows what you're doing and why you're doing it, and that this is to answer a simple question, and that's all it's there to do. And if you can't ask that question, then nothing will change. You have to develop a, a reasonably high level of knowledge in the ultrasound modalities that you want to use and identify mentors and practice, um, particularly on the IMT, blocks of people doing IMT, going to intensive care is a great opportunity to, to get hands on with this stuff and to start trying to apply it clinically in situations where the patient is more compliant to examination. And as long as it's done with consent and understanding and with mentorship, there's no problem there. As long as you as long as you consult the right people and as long as you practice within a safe realm of what you know you can achieve and you make sure when you find sinister or concerning features that it's escalated there's no reason to be overly concerned and in time a credit which we'll talk about briefly at the end the thing that you can't do is ignore your significant findings make big changes practice way outside your knowledge or practical understanding of the ultrasound modality or go and perform generalised, non-specific examinations as if they are equivalent to what will happen in the ultrasound department. So that's not what this is about. This is about identifying things early so you can make nuanced decisions, small little decisions on the side of things to help patient care in that moment. This is not about going and having a look for everything. No ultrasound scanner will ever replace the old CT for accepted pelvis. And the big thing you've got to do is commit that time to learning. And if you don't do that, you will constantly run into problems. There has been a, a reasonably rapid development of the a variety of different um, examination bodies trying to provide some degree of accreditation to the practice of point of care ultrasound in the UK. We're well behind where America is and in other developed countries that use ultrasound more re readily than us in this regard. I mean, it comes to a very difficult question of how examination under ultrasound compares to examination clinically. And is it is our ability to look at something on ultrasound where it's more visual any different to examining a patient with a stethoscope? And the degree that there we have, if we if we miss a murmur that we're somehow accountable to it, would still be the shape would still be the same by that logic. It isn't quite clear where ultrasound is going to fit in that picture. If ultrasound will just be like um, the equivalent of putting a stethoscope on a chest. Most of raw culture suggests that's not how we should be looking at it. We should be trying to do more to ensure that our practice is more, is more evidenced and that we have a better either route to accreditation or logbook to account for the scanning that we're doing. The difficulty is that when you see someone ultrasound, it may well be hard to defend if there's an image that's, that's traceable and you're unable to interpret it. The, the difficulty that a majority of the accreditation pathways have is the idea that you're going to be answering simple questions. Now, FUSIC, which is the intensive care echo um, pathway, have a very good system to ensuring you're just answering simple questions. And as long as you do that, most of your actions should be defendable difficulty is then is if you're starting to broaden out when you see abnormalities when you're doing some, a scan for another reason and the example would be doing a scan to rule out hydronephrosis in the patient with acute kidney injury and seeing a mass in a kidney or a liver by accident and in that case do you need accountability for that but ultimately that wasn't the main aim of what you were set out to do and some of this is about the beneficence to the patient of being able to spot these things early but also the potential negligence of not being able to identify everything when you have a look at an image you can't say everything about that image and that's a difficult situation because no one else may gratify that image again after you've taken it so so in summary um point of care access a uh, point of care ultrasound is a, a a potentially a great modality we could start applying for our patients to improve the inpatient care in the, the medical ward setting to the outpatient setting, to the critical care setting, it's something that has a great scope to drastically improve the care that we can provide for our patients. We're not doing it as medics, but the future may well need, may need us to change that attitude. And it's a difficult skill to learn, but when it's used correctly and it's used safely, it can make a big difference to the care of our patients.
If you've got an interest in it, if, if, if anything I've said has interested you, there's lots of colleagues out there who share these interests, a growing number of medics who are interested in this, uh, but certainly lots of emergency department colleagues and intensive care colleagues who are practising points of care ultrasound at this time. So finding mentors, finding other individuals that are interested can be relatively simple. And we live in a great age these days of, of Twitter, having loads of people who support it and talk about it, lots of online resources available for e-learning for health, available through sites like Perkus 101, which was the main site I've used for most of my, my scanning career. Life in the Fast Lane has courses on it. Uh, the Society of Acute Medicine has its own courses, again, accessible for e-learning for health, and, and Radio Pedro. All these sites have lots of information to help you be knowledge-based. Ultimately, a mentor is good to help you start putting the probes on chests and start examining people. So I hope that's been of some use. I'll, um, I'll be contactable by email as I posted at the start. Um, or if you know me, feel free to, to ask me any questions. And if there is anything specific I can help with, then feel free to drop me an email. Otherwise, it's um, hopefully something that people will be a little bit more aware of. And if people want to start applying it in their practice, well, hopefully this can act as the, the jumping board to do so. So thank you very much for your time. Um, so any questions at all, just drop me an email and otherwise I'll leave you to it. Have a good day.